Welcome to Success Story, the most useful podcast in the world. I'm your host, Scott D. Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. The HubSpot Podcast Network has other great podcasts like Marketing Made Simple, hosted by Dr. J.J. Peterson. Marketing Made Simple brings you practical tips to make your marketing easy and more importantly, make it work. Now, if any of these topics sound interesting to you, you're going to love his show, how to write and deliver captivating speeches, how to market yourself into a new job, how design can help and potentially hurt your revenue, and how to create a social media ad strategy that works. If these topics hit home and they're things that you want to learn about, go listen to Marketing Made Simple wherever you get your podcasts. Today, my guest is Denise Schul. She is the founder and CEO of Rethink. She leverages her background in neuroscience and modern psychoanalysis to solve the mental mysteries of successful investing, trading, competing, and leading teams. She is known for her uncanny effectiveness in resolving mental blocks and decision conundrums, often called the real life Wendy Rhodes from Billions. Uh, she has an MA in neuropsychoanalysis from the University of Chicago, and she authored the best selling book, Market Mind Games. Uh, she is a celebrated performance coach. She specializes in working with hedge funds, pro athletes, and other high octane professionals at the top of their respective fields. She recently coached snowboarder Lindsay uh, Yacobellis to a gold medal at the Beijing Olympics earlier this year. She has been featured in outlets including CNBC, Fox Business, Bloomberg TV, Yahoo Finance, Forbes, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg Markets, and more. She is keynoted for UBS, Credit Suisse, MIT Sloan Fellows, the US Ski and Snowboard Association, and Harvard Business School. As the founder of Rethink Group, uh, which is a team of risk performance and strategy advisors. She focuses on the positive contribution of feelings and emotions in high pressure situations and how to make optimal decisions. So we spoke about all things decision making, improving your performance mind game, overcoming biases, real versus personal feelings, radicalizing your approach to human achievement, the true psychology of risk in any situation, the secret to better performance, and why you should address your fears, frustrations, and disappointments. The Rethink Group and the kind of performance consulting we do right now started, really, I'm going to put two moments together. One, I was sitting in a class in New York City, um, a class in something called modern psychoanalysis. And a person in the class admitted to being formally paranoid schizophrenic and in that of Bellevue and saying, oh yeah, the instructor cured me. And I was like, what? <laughs> but then I was like, well, if she could do that, like it could help these crazy traders I work with. So it was that. And then that same instructor asked to publish my master's thesis in her small little academic journal of modern psychoanalysis. And I was like, it's old. You can't do that. Like, she's like, well, how about you update? And I'm like, that's a lot of work. But I'm like, okay, we'll be cool to be published in a, in a you know, academic journal. So I'll do it. And Antonio Damasio had written a book called Descartes. And what he was referring to is Descartes, the philosopher, said, I think, therefore, I am. And Damasio and his colleagues were like, you know, that's actually wrong. It's I feel, therefore I am. And so they were showing that you cannot make any decision without emotion. And I was like, well, well, well. That changes everything about trading and investing psychology. So between those two things, I just started talking about it to people. And the next thing I knew, Someone asked me to write an article and then someone asked me to give a talk and then it took on a life of its own. Um, now, a, a, a question is, is the understand, like, I think that there is a, a understanding that psychology and the human condition definitely affects trading. So that's not unknown. Um, I'm assuming for more experienced traders, but what is, what is the thing that you're highlighting when you work with traders that perhaps is a huge detriment or a huge asset to their, uh, to their success. What is the, what is the, 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 the mental um, uh, or the, the neuro thing or item that maybe isn't explored enough that you really have brought out and 
and brought to the forefront of trading through rethink through your work through your research through your papers through your writing um yeah that help that helps traders and helps all performance and again i wonder there's two parts to the answer the first is everyone thinks okay. everyone, but the, the vast majority of people think you know take the emotion out of it, number one and if they can tolerate any emotion it's take the negative emotion out always be positive they're both wrong um, so like, literally I say, the thing I want people to do is change their opinion of their feelings and emotions. Um, number one to how imperative they are, i.e. like people think they make decisions based on some analysis and it doesn't matter what realm it is, right? Like it doesn't matter where, what restaurant you want to go to, or, you know, what you want to put 20% of your portfolio in. You think you make a decision based on some analysis. You don't. You make the decision on how you feel about the analysis, um, your confidence in the outcome that you're predicting. So, and that outcome, believe it or not, subconsciously you understand is a feeling. It's called um, anticipatory affect. So I basically like ask people to change their opinion, change their thoughts about their feelings and emotions. And when they do, they, Find there's like a whole different world in which they can accomplish more of what they want to accomplish. It doesn't matter what realm. I mean, it takes a specific sort of form in trading and investing because of the complexity of the mental game in trading and investing, and there's no other game like it. But the underlying principle is the same. Like treat, I really say senses, feelings, and emotions because those are just degrees of intensity of like information your body's giving you, um, treat them differently. Like, and you open up this whole new world. So that's the cornerstone so what, of everything. Okay. So what you, so what we're trying to do for just general human performance is we're trying to remove, and I'm just trying to simplify and understand it. And if I, if I butcher this, please like correct me. That's fine. So if we're, tr so we're trying to remove the, the emotions tied to, so the, so we, anal we, we, we analyze something and then based on that analysis, then that's, we, we have an emotional attachment to what we feel is the analysis that we've done on that thing. And that's what, that's what screws us all up because we actually, we actually aren't just analyzing an outcome and then acting on, uh, the true logic or the data behind that analysis. It's, it's really our confidence in our own ability to analyze, which is inherently flawed. I'm assuming. Well, it, it boils down to this. So let's, the human brain is trying to keep the human being safe. That's like its only job. And it does that by pre constantly predicting how something's going to turn out, mm -hmm. what's going to actually happen but more specifically, how that's going to feel to you. So you, you know, do this analysis, whatever it is, and the, the data gives you some conclusion. Well, you have a feeling about like, if that conclusion plays out, how safe will I be? But essentially like how, well, how happy will I be? How well will it work out? You know, will I feel good? So if it's the restaurant tonight and you have a taste for steak and like, you're okay, that's the best steak place. And if you go there, you know, I'm going to get a meal that makes me feel good. I'm going to be satisfied and I'm going to be happy we did it. You know, if it's an investment, it's like, is that the price of that investment going to change in a way that I'm going to make money? So therefore I'll feel good about it, but also be safer because I would make more money. So, but people don't know this. They don't know that they are always predicting how something's going to make them feel in the future. Like people who are listening to this are right now predicting whether they should continue to listen to me because either I'm crazy or mm -hmm. this is super interesting. And like, are they going to feel like they wasted their time or are they going to learn something? Like, but if you listen to yourself, you can, you can hear that. Well, that's the cornerstone of what makes you do something or not do something. So like a common you know, theme, let's say, in human performance is like, why did I do that again? Like, I don't understand. I said I wasn't going to do that again. Like, or why didn't I do, you know, why did I do that? Or why didn't I do that? You know, I don't care. Exercise, you know, finish the, the proposal, whatever. Pick the thing. Well, you did or didn't because underneath your consciousness was some prediction of a feeling about how it was going to turn out. 
and like it's working this way. Like this is the sunrises in the east of human behavior, but next to no one knows it. But what happens is when you know it, like then you really understand the problem. And your chances of navigating a challenge, you know, the challenge of human life, whether it's business or anything, is understanding it better. Like if you want to do a thing better, you gotta understand the factors. So, I mean, the reason, you know, the reason I and we think have gotten a reputation for being effective is literally this. And it's not that I'm such a genius. I just happen to be interested in it. And I also happen to have been raised in a way that it was maybe easier for me to not accept the status quo. Um, you know, it was a little bit easier for me to buck the system, so to speak. Um, yeah. So I could read the research and I could put two and two together and I could talk about it. And what ended up happening is literally when I first started talking about it, which was way back like 2004 or five, the reason it took on a life of its own is because people would come to me and say, oh my God, that makes so much sense to me. Like, well, so it's, it's like, it's like eye opening, really. It's yeah. very eye opening when you think about it. And so then the feedback, you know, propelled me to do more, right? Or it got me more invitations to speak or more invitations to coach or to write. And so like, again, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that I was like such a genius. I was sort of in the right place at the right time, interested in the right thing and had the courage to talk about it and then got the feedback and then that made it take on a life of its own. But a lot of people probably were, were so awed by the work that you're doing because most people don't, uh, even know where to begin looking like it's almost the decision making process is sort of taken for granted. I think that in our day to day, we don't try and we don't try and delve into why we make the decisions that we make. It's it's a scary concept, because when you unpack that, then all of a sudden, if you if you unpack the first bit of it, and you understand that maybe why your decision making process is flawed, then that leads to the question, well, then how do I make a good decision? And that's a question yeah. I have for you. So wh what do you recommend people after you if after you sort of show them the light, so to speak, and, and, and they start to understand that every decision that they make has all these biases attached to the, that decision, then then how do they go through life? Yeah. So the question to learn to ask yourself and to answer accurately, and those are two separate tasks, but is what am I feeling and why am I feeling it? And you want the answers to be the truth. Now, that's easier said than done. Um, a lot of my coaching is like helping people get the accurate answer because what they think they're feeling or why they think they're feeling is generally not what it is. Um, this will, by the way, circumvent the cognitive biases. Mm -hmm. So a thing in the behavioral finance, cognitive bias, you know, confirmation bias, recency bias, literature is way gag, your human brain is biased and there's nothing you can do about it, you know, and you're stuck with that. It's not true. <laughs> um, it's based on the wrong model of the brain. It's basically, I mean, it's called behavioral finance or cognitive behavior because it's like thinking and doing, you know, thinking and behaving. You know, like the juice is in the feeling. So <laughs> the cognitive behavior world doesn't get that. So like confirmation bias, when you see the thing you want to see. Well, everyone talks about how difficult it is to you know, circumvent that or to avert it. Well, all you have to do is like realize like what's that feeling? And what that feeling is usually like if you, and this happens all the time with hedge fund managers. I mean, I had a relatively new client yesterday talking about like he went to his investment committee and he stated like his viewpoint and he's in commodities, you know? And so this is my viewpoint of how commodities are gonna play out. And then he said, you know, if he starts to look like he's wrong, you know, he doesn't really want to go back to the investment committee and say, you know, on second thought, never mind, I was wrong. Because <laughs> why? Because it's embarrassing. Yeah. You know, he's afraid he'll react negatively. Conf so people behave in what looks like confirmation bias, i.e. they only see the data that supports whatever their viewpoint already is. Um, not because they're just programmed to do that, because at the moments that they're seeing conflicting data, 
they're predicting this future emotion that, you know, that's unsafe, right? They're going to be embarrassed. Their boss is going to be mad at them. And they're basically trying to avoid that scenario. Well, the truth is, if you face that scenario earlier in the, your process, whatever, the chances that you end up with the embarrassment go down. Because like when you, you, you stated some, you know, prediction to your firm, whatever it is, I don't care, sales, investment, I don't care, whatever it is. And you start to get information that's not working out the way you thought. Well, the sooner you get that and the sooner you change course and address, you know, the better the odds of a better outcome, right? But if you delay because you don't really realize you're predicting this future embarrassment, the outcome is probably worse. But like people have no cognitive ability to override that underlying prediction of embarrassment, except to use their thinking to address, wait a minute, I'm really worried. You know, I don't want to turn out to be wrong because I'm going to have sounded like an idiot. It's going to be embarrassing and maybe I'll even lose my job because people have tendency to catastrophize. But the truth is the earlier in any scenario that you can face you know, alternative data that shows your prediction may not be turning out. Like, chances are you can course correct earlier. But it requires knowing that you're feeling like you're predicting this future problem. That's going to give you, it gives you the space to navigate um, that you don't have if you're just like torturing the data to prove that your original prediction is correct while you're crossing your fingers and hoping and experiencing all this anxiety and, oh my God, I hope I turn out to be right. No. <laughs> well, I, it, when you say, when you, when you lay it out, it actually makes a lot of sense, but you, I guess, so the issue that we're sort of uncovering is a little bit of, like you mentioned, like we have biases, but after a certain point, there's ego involved. There, like there, you just don't want to be embarrassed. So when, when you speak to people that operate at this level, the things that are fears, are they valid fears? Like, I, in my opinion, they would be valid fears. Like, if I make a sales prediction and it's totally off, at any point when I bring that up with my board, it, it, they're probably going to have some level of um, there's going to be some thought, like, as to whether or not I'm competent. That's a, yeah, that's something that I right, feel right. will happen. <laughs> like, 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 right. like if, if you walk through the scenario, it's like completely logical, right? Like. So this is the thing, like an emotion, particularly like fear, has a totally bad rap, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're not supposed to feel fear, feel fear or give in to fear or whatever. And, and like, it's not true. Like if it weren't for fear, there's a lot of accomplishments we all have that we wouldn't have accomplished. Like who would really graduate from college if it weren't for fear? Right? <laughs> you do all this other stuff. You know, but you're afraid of the outcome of only partying and not getting the actual degree. Like, so you do the work, you know, you, know, you really do the work just because you want to do the work, right? Like you do the work because you're afraid of what will happen. Like in their pure form, fear, frustration, disappointment, have information for us. So we've got two problems. We've been told not to recognize any of them. And we've certainly been told not to focus on the so-called negative ones. When they're in their pure form, they're actually trying to help us. They're trying to keep us safe, trying to help us get what we want. Like frustration is something's going wrong. Take the extreme form of frustration. Well, the extreme form would be like rage, but let's take the interim, anger. Why do people get angry? Because they feel as if something's wrong. So, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's their own personal um, expectation. And that's like the next layer of this, what part is real and what part is your own personality, but we can come back to that. Like at its core, like if you're angry about something, your psyche is telling you that something isn't the way you think it should be. And maybe you should try to research yourself and find out what that is, as opposed to saying, I shouldn't be angry. Because what the research actually shows is you suppress those emotions, particularly the negative ones the voice in your psyche gets louder. So they become more disruptive, not less disruptive. And, and research actually it, shows this if you suppress it, that yeah. this will I mean, there's, impact. you know, I mean, 
the truth is, you know, in psychology research, you can probably find research to show whatever you want. But <laughs> That's there, fair, but, but the, yes. But there's a good body of research that shows that understanding your negative emotions, acknowledging them, leads to better outcomes. Particularly if it matters to you. Like there was, when I first heard of this research, it was probably 2008. And I met this woman who at that time was a like a postdoc PhD, and she had done this research project to show that reframing um, you know, situations was a net positive. And to her credit, her research showed that wasn't true. That if you reframed, in other words, you know, took a positive viewpoint of something on something that didn't matter that much to you, it worked. But if you did it on something that actually really mattered to you, your anxiety levels went up and it didn't work. Why? Because your psyche's like, your psyche really is trying to keep you safe. And that kind of includes more than safe. Like it includes thrive. So if you have some unpleasant feeling, it's like, like, you know, all of a sudden you like feel this horrible pain in your leg and you look down and you know, you've got a gash in your chin for whatever reason, you know, like what's the point? The point of the physical pain is like, so that you do something about it. Why is it any different with emotional pain? And you made, now this is an interesting, you're making interesting points because originally we almost, when we first started speaking about all the all these um, emotions that we feel. Your your first point was almost well, we have to know when to not listen to these emotions because they're clouding our analysis, and we're and we're making incorrect assumptions based on um, emotional feedback and maybe uh, maybe historical uh, insight and feedback. But obviously, emotions do have a place where they keep us safe and they allow us to thrive. So how do we? How do we understand which emotions are valid and which emotions will steer us in the right direction? And maybe this is what you were alluding to before, like the real emotions versus emotions tied to your personality or to your past experiences. So how do we how do we understand when to include those in our decision making process versus when to exclude them so we make smarter, less emotionally charged or driven decisions? <laughs> First of all, just laughs. <laughs> I laugh because I don't I actually think you might have misheard me. And I think it might be an example of like, it's hard to hear something that's so different. Yeah. I personally believe. I probably did. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I am don't, I totally screwed something up. I don't totally screw. But in all of my work is based on the fact that emotions are the absolute best asset you have. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. In every realm at every moment. But more than that, you actually can't avoid them. So like, give it up. Like, it's a, and I'm not speaking to you specifically, but like, I honestly think the analogy is, is round or flatter. Like it looks like emotions really get in your way. Just like it looks like the earth is flat, but it's a misunderstanding of how it's really working. It's the lack so, of awareness of that emotions are impacting you is what is actually the detriment. It's almost like yeah, it's a too. lack of under. It's, I mean, because here's here's a fact that no one ever thinks about. You know, it's always like control your emotions, so you you don't do this thing that turns out to be destructive, right? Mm -hmm. You don't know, just scream at your boss or you know smack your kid or whatever. Like control your emotions. Well, you don't have to control your emotions. You can feel whatever you want or whatever you do. Feel. It's only what you do. So the actual piece of advice is you know control, or I might be slightly make that positive, choose your actions. Now, how do you choose your best action? By understanding what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. Now, that's a layered thing where we all have expectations of how something will turn out because this is really just not what you're feeling about now, it's what you're feeling about the future. Like confidence is what? Confidence is a prediction that something's gonna work out, whatever it is. My snowboarder client winning a gold medal this finally this year or an investment, it doesn't matter. What, what does confidence mean? I, I'm gonna choose the right steak place because I'm confident that they'll deliver me a good meal and I won't, you know. Um, 
so I talk about things. Sometimes I talk about the future and sometimes I make it sound like it's here and now, but it's always about the future, but it doesn't even matter that much. Like, oops, I just dropped part of my headset went off out of my ear. Um, You're good. good. There's a personal, these emotions are layered. So there's the obvious like fear of missing out that people feel in all sorts of realms. Well, fear of missing out is really fear of future regret. If you like you say, okay, what happens if I miss out? Well, I won't have gotten something. Well, how will I feel if I won't have gotten it? Well, I might regret that I didn't do the thing that would have gotten me that. And so people try to avoid future regret because they really, regret's really like really an unpleasant thing, like wishing you would have done something differently. Yeah, it's really not fun. Um, so understanding that when you're you know, dying to go to a party or dying to stay in a losing trade, like it, and you think it's fear of missing out, but it's really fear of future regret, like that you're gonna feel bad in the future. When you understand that, you actually feel more empowered to, with a wider range of choices. Now, having said, and you can do that for anything where there's kind of a very common thread of feelings that basically all human beings feel in pretty much all circumstances, whether they know it or not. Then underneath that is a personal, you know, what we would call kind of ego driven prediction. So some people will be afraid of being rejected. Some people will be afraid of being wrong. You know, that is based on their own personal experience. Now, when you have something that really tweaks you, right? And you get this really strong emotion and everybody will say, control the emotion. I say, no, analyze the emotion before you act. Choose your actions. And the best way to do that is to understand what you're feeling accurately and why you're really feeling it. And why might be, you know, I'm worried that my sales prediction is gonna be off. Now. For someone that might be, you know, they were always criticized in school, whatever, for whatever, you know. And so they can know that the here and now part is how is my board going to react to the sales prediction? But also, like, uh, I'm personally more worried about that. So I have a client in London, hedge fund manager, and he was criticized for everything he did. Grew up in the United States on a farm. And like, no matter what he did, his grandfather criticized him for the wood not being stacked right or whatever. And so this morning, I was just talking to him right before you. It was like, okay, you know, he's worried. He has a thesis about the market. He's well positioned. He's not as large position as he should be right now. And I'm like, it's the wood. You know, it's the... You must have stacked the wood. I said, but it's actually not the wood. Like, you're really good at this and you can trust yourself right now. And, you know, grandpa's not going to be criticizing you about the wood being not stacked because you're right. Mm-hmm. It's not the wood. So there's a common layer and then there's a personal layer. And when I say, what am I feeling and why? Your own why is going to be different than mine. But if you know that some portion of that is your own past, it can dilute the intensity of it in the moment and your ability to see your wider range of choices is larger. Am I making any sense? <laughs> You're making a ton of sense. And okay, good. I- I'm curious when people operate at such a high level, um, how calm is it? How, like when you look at the, the top hedge fund managers in the world, and that would probably be the best example because they, there's a there's a ton of risk associated with that, but also in, in venture capital and private equity and day trading and um, all these different individuals that there's they tr- they try and remove emotion from situations. Um, is well, actually, I would ask you the top performing individuals in the world do they have the best mastery of this of of what you teach in terms of understanding your emotions, thinking through actions. Is that what separates them? Yes and no. I mean, first of all, you have to say, okay, you know, Denise's clients have called her to work with her. And the usual reason in the hedge fund world is to follow their intuition more, which is sort of ironic given that behavioral finances, you shouldn't use your intuition. But I mean, honestly, client after client after client who manages, you know, something, you know, 
ranging in billions of dollars will say, I really want to like listen to my intuition. Well, why? Because by the way, intuition is unconscious pattern recognition and it's unconscious pattern recognition based on your education and your experience. And if you have expertise, you have intuition or instinct, but it's trained out of you, right? Like do it according to the math, do it according to the probabilities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, don't get me started because it's actually a subjective probability. It's not really even worth, you can't even know it in the market, but um, explain explain that though explain why I, i'm actually curious because that's actually an interesting point because i'm sure that somebody who actually operates in that world this this particular situation will resonate with them if they've never worked with you before so intuition is trained out of these individuals that operate in say we'll use a billion dollar hedge fund um and they look at data analysis forecasting why is that an issue at the end of the day there's only one thing you want to do in financial markets and everybody's trying to do this. And that is predict what other people are gonna pay for something in the future, whatever time frame your future is. That's called theory of mind, by the way, you have a theory of their mind and there's brain research that shows that the people who are relying most on their theory of mind skills make better price predictions. And oh, by the way, in that study, they are not doing math at all. Um, so first of all, the markets are a social game and it's really about other market participants future perception, that's a human question. Um, it's not a math question. All the probabilities are just clues. Like what are the probabilities based on? In the past, the price action behaved like this in response to these factors. So we would expect in the future, the other human beings playing in the market will behave similarly. Now, it's not knowable. It's not dice. It's not blackjack. It's not poker. It's like poker in that in, you, know, you win in poker by predicting how the people are betting. But in the markets, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, and the value of the cards changes too. Like, and you have to sort of notice when the value of the cards will change. Um, so people who learn to play the game of markets, you know, little by little, they start to sense how the waves move, if you want to use a surfing analogy. Mm -hmm. And that becomes not something they really think about, but something they sense. Well, that sense is intuition. It's unconscious pattern recognition based on what they learned about the market and then their experience with how the prices move. And I mean, you know, all of these people, you know, most of them have graduate degrees. Most of them have been in the market for 20, 30, 40 years. So they have a lot of interaction with how the prices move under a given set of circumstances. They have a lot of assumptions about what will make the price move. But we're back to, we don't make decisions on data. We make decisions on how we feel about the data that create a certain analysis and a certain prediction. In markets, that's called subjective probability. Like you have a probability, but it really is subjective, right? It's your, it's the result of your own analysis. Um, navigating that is navigating the feelings your body's giving you. Like this happens all the time. <laughs> I mean, most of my, I like literally, I talk to people for 55 minutes once or twice a week. And I have people that I've talked to for years and years and like, they call me up and they have a particular position and they think they should do this or that with it. And I just ask questions and I listen for the feeling they're giving me. And I'll realize they actually, their intuition is telling them the exact opposite of what they're telling me verbally. Like they're saying, maybe I should get out of this when the truth is they really think they should get bigger. Hmm. So I'm just trying to lead them through that. What are you feeling and why? But it's a little hard because and nobody's been, you know, everybody's been trained to do the opposite their entire lives. Um, it can be done, though, by the way. You're actually, if you endeavor to do it by changing your opinion about your feelings and emotions, and changing your strategy and tactics for them, you're actually like going more with the flow of human perception and judgment. So there's an aspect where it actually just gets easier. Like, because you're not fighting yourself. You're not fighting the... Like the, your psyche is trying to give you information through your feelings and emotions and you're trying to fight it like it. That makes figuring out the right thing to do even that much harder. 
I just want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, they don't call it the sales destination. It's a sales journey. And on that journey, you want the best tools and support to keep you and your customers connected every step of the way. HubSpot is an all-in-one CRM platform that is impossible to outgrow and ridiculously easy to use, meaning you never have to worry about it slowing you down. That's because HubSpot is purpose-built for real salespeople with real customers and real problems to solve. With customizable hubs and tools that you can add and subtract as you grow and an interface that's just as easy to use if you're a team of one or 1,000, HubSpot is built for you and your customers to grow together wherever the journey takes you. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. So, okay, so then the, the follow-up for somebody who's listening and and everything you're saying resonates and they're just wondering, okay, I, I know that I need to better listen to my intuition, my feeling. Um, what's an exercise? Like, how do you, how do you recommend when you work with the people that you work with, how do you get them to better tap into, into themselves? We constantly ask, like, like, it, like I, the questions I ask, what's the worst that could happen? What do you really think is going to happen? Not, you don't have to be right in this conversation, right? Like you, you create a space for yourself where you're completely non-judgmental. You simultaneously want to know that what that future emotion you're predicting is. I, I can't really overstate how powerful it can be to realize that you're thinking something and about to do something literally just because you're trying to avoid future embarrassment. And when you shine like a light on that, you know, of your, well, the light in this case is your consciousness. Oftentimes people will go, well, damn, that's not actually a really good reason. Mm -hmm. Like is, is the, by the way, a question you can ask there is, is this feeling about the situation? Like, is this feeling telling me something about the problem I'm trying to solve? Or is this feeling about me? Because if the feeling's about you, chances are it has nothing to do. If Jennifer Lerner of Harvard called it integral emotions and incidental emotions, I call them informational emotions or irrelevant emotions or in the market intuition and impulse. Like, you know, maybe there are times when, you know, you would be embarrassed that it matters enough, but generally that's not a good data point if you're trying to analyze some situation, some business situation in the world, you know? So there's a skill. It's called emotion differentiation, emotion granularity, but it basically means you can put your feelings into words. So you can tell the difference between fear, frustration, disappointment, and you can tell the difference between uh, gradations of fear or gradations of frustration. So like with my investment clients, I so happen to have two new clients in September. And both of them, like the, one of the first things I have to do is write down every word for every emotion that they feel in the process of managing, you know, a book, it's called a book in a hedge fund. Um, because I want them to start to be able to be more granular because the research shows that the more granular a portfolio manager can be, particularly in negative emotions, the more money they make. Why? How accurate, how accurate are they at identifying these emotions the first time they do uh, that? Well, uh, I, I, so I, I've only reviewed one of them so far. The other one sent me his homework this morning, but I had a chance to look at it, excuse me. Um, I was, it was interesting with the one that I reviewed. He, um, the positive emotions were that they were like happy, you know, joyful, pleased. The negative emotions were behavior. They were, um, let me see if I can even remember. Um, stubborn. That will just use stubborn. Like, I'm like, well, what does stubborn mean? I mean, stubborn <laughs> means you're doing, you know, like you refuse to change, right? That's actually, a bit, you don't feel stubborn. You don't, I feel stubborn today. I mean, maybe once in a while, you know, if you're joking with your wife or something. But I mean, you don't walk around saying, I feel stubborn. What he really felt was like afraid of being wrong. So therefore, like it was a confirmation bias thing. You know, I won't see the disconfirming data because I'm afraid of having to say I was wrong. I'm afraid of being embarrassed. I'm afraid of looking bad at my new fund because you just started at this place. That ends up being a stubborn behavior. So... And that happens a lot. 
when you first ask a person to do this, they give you a lot of either, my palms are sweating, my heart is racing, you know, some physical thing that's happening. Or a behavior, a thing they're doing, but not the actual emotion behind it. Mm. I know it's this almost is, like... I really, I really do know that I am speaking to an audience that, and forgive the analogy, but because it just, you know, that the, the ocean looks flat. Like you're here. No, it's, but that's what's so, that's round. what's so fascinating. You're, you're, te you're teaching me as, as you're teaching the audience. It's all about, listen, with, with, there's a lot of topics that I know a lot about. This is definitely not one of them um, because because it's a very difficult topic to, to wrap your mind around. And then I think yeah. that the whole point of this conversation is to understand this is like this is the the gateway in. This is the this is the first pass at getting people to to self-examine and to understand how their emotions are affecting or hindering their performance. It, it's It's wild to think this because we get so caught up in the day to day and there's so much noise and so much activity that it really takes a special kind of mindset to be able to calm down, remove all the noise, remove all the activity and actually look at how you're feeling and how you're operating. And I think that's actually what separates mediocre from exemplary performance in, in any in trading and business and sports and anything. Right. What I'm going to say, I'm going to add to that. How someone handles the negative, the so-called negative, because I don't really think they're negative, they're just unpleasant emotions, is the difference. You know, what you do with your fear, what you do with your frustration, what you do with your disappointment. Do you unpack them so you find the lesson? Or do you act them out, which is really the two choices. Like, because if you don't know what you're feeling or you're trying to suppress an emotion, you act it out. And if you act it out randomly, i.e. like not making a choice, because you can make a choice to act on fear, you can make a choice to act on anger, but it's better if you've used your cognition, that's where to use your cognition. But that's the difference. Like, and my clients, you know, take Lindsay Jacob Ellis, who, for those of you who don't know, just won two gold medals in snowboard cross and in her fifth Olympics at 36 years old. After, in her first Olympics, where she basically gave up gold at the last second, and it's kind of a classic sports story. Um, and then she could win everywhere but the Olympics. Like, can I tell you that Lindsay's completely managed her, you know, like surpassed or moved through her fears and frustrations in total in life? No. Can I tell you that she learned to handle them at the Olympics in a completely different way? Yes. And that's what allowed her to win. And that's, so when you, when you work through, when you work through this process with her, with hedge fund managers, with business leaders, um, that's one use case for a high performance athlete. Uh, maybe give over one more, one more, just paint a story or a picture of how this actually impacts when somebody, uh, when somebody works with you for a period of time, how does this impact a business performance or, or a portfolio performance even like in terms of numbers percentile without naming names, if you're under NDA, most likely, but like, what does that actually translate to when somebody dives into this and starts to understand it? Well, I mean, the range is all over the board, right? But I mean, we've I mean, I, I'm giving you a chance to brag. Your 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 most impressive stories. <laughs> I tend, I tend. I mean, in some ways, I can brag. Like, you like can totally brag. <laughs> no, no. Like, like I, I have said, and I believe this. I can solve any performance problem with anyone, anywhere on the planet. It doesn't matter. That's pretty good. That's pretty, that's pretty wild. That's amazing. Well, it's literally like, if you, like, you know, I basically just noticed that the earth is round. And so I'm like, hey, I can sail around. it. Now, I mean, it is true that a person can have resistance to solving it. And that makes it harder. In that situation, I can know exactly what's going on and exactly what needs to happen. But I have to work with them longer to to break through the resistance. Like I have a private equity guy who's upset that he has never gotten 
the same title as the other people that he works with. But he doesn't want to see that he has this history of, you know, while he was growing up, of not being given the thing that he wanted. And so that's influencing how he's acting and influencing him not getting it. But he doesn't want to go there because, like, what does my childhood have to do with anything? Well, mm. that, the human brain is constantly predicting based on your past experience. And the most important past experience is the first 10 years of life in terms of who you are, now your ego. Um, but I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, my portfolio manager's not, not every single one of them has made like 100% more. But pretty much. But you notice significant. Them. You notice significant. Like pretty much every one of them has had. Well, they say crazy. They say crazy things like, "You're the only person ever that's made this make sense and helped me to avoid that thing I did." Mm -hmm. You know, well, I should know this, but um, I mean, people call me like the Yoda performance coaches, or like all their study and all their years, like I finally made sense. But again, it goes back to I literally. Like literally, I was interested in my own emotions and my own decision making and my own, you know, sometimes getting in my own way and both personally and professionally. And I just refused to accept the, you know, well, if I stand up straight and smile, I'll feel more confident because I was like, come on. <laughs> like, come on. I think that, that I think just that's can't be true. No, you're, well, that's the thing. I think that what you're highlighting is is an issue with most individuals that operate at a high level, like that, like that a private equity guy that didn't want to uh, address his childhood, there's an ego involved. And I think that that's why when you break down that ego and you, you accept that help into your life, that's when you really see your performance skyrocket. Like that's it's, you just have to get rid of the ego and, and, and understand that you don't have everything figured out. I yeah. It's hard. hard. It's hard because if you go back to the brain is always predicting your future safety. Like mm -hmm. all of our safety is at least partially dependent on our reputation. It's partially dependent on other people. So, and that's just a fact. And so we're, you know, we're essentially programmed to think about how we're going to be perceived. I mean, some of us more than others. You know, like I said earlier, like I had less of that just because of the environment that I grew up in, as opposed to even to my husband who grew up in a big proper Southern family, you know, and there were a lot of like expectations of how you should behave. <laughs> I didn't have any of that. Um, I will say this, though. <laughs> um, since I started with the modern psychoanalyst and the schizophrenic, what Hyman Spotnitz was the psychoanal psychoanalyst who got kicked out of Freudian New York Psychoanalytic Society, which was the place to be, um, because he thought two things. He thought you didn't have to be a medical doctor to be a psychoanalyst. And he thought you didn't necessarily have to interpret exactly what happened to you, but you did have to understand what you were angry about. And his thesis was that if you could face your unconscious anger, you could get anything you wanted. And that is true for my clients. So and it's how his theory was that it's really unconscious rage that makes someone who becomes schizophrenic split off part of their personality and it was this wildly controversial and you know there's people with that woman is crazy um but if you can understand like your own anger and not judge it both in the moment and as it relates to what's happened to you in the past it is a uh, can i swear you can totally swear <laughs> it's a goddamn fucking superpower it is i love that it is like but what you have to do is go like, you know, I say, what am I feeling and why? It's like, what am I angry about? And really why? Like, what's the prediction in that? And like, okay, how much of that is in the moment? And how much is fueled by whatever happened to you in the past? But like, then finding the thing that's pure, that's like, I'm angry because there's this situation in the moment and it shouldn't be that way. Like that's fuel for action that fixes it. But the process is not, it's, you're told to control it and suppress it and set it aside and it's bad for you and blah, 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 blah. No, you have to understand it. You have to 
like I'm not that big of a meditation person, but I think I have a very meditative way about it because I'm basically always sort of saying, what am I feeling and why? Like that's a mindful thing, right? Like I, I'm trying to understand these signals my body's giving me through my intellect, like through the way, you know, I've learned the meanings of words and I've learned, you know, I've experienced lots of situations like that I didn't have if I was a little kid. So it's not like the intellect's irrelevant, it's a tool. Um, anyway, I could go on and on and on. And on. No, <laughs> that's amazing. I, that's, <laughs> that's perfect. No, 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 you're good. You're good. I, I find this fascinating and I, and I hope that for the listeners, um, like I said, this is a rabbit hole that they can definitely go down. Like you said, if you, it's, it's, it's akin to you thinking the, the earth is flat and then you're discovering for the first time that it's not flat, which means yeah. that there's a lot of work that you have to do on yourself to get you to the point where you can identify the things that, that now come very naturally to you and probably a lot of the people that you work with. Um, but I want to, so I want to um, give people the opportunity to connect with you outside of the podcast. Um, but before we, we close this out, um, where, uh, or I guess like last piece of advice that you give the audience, something they can take away and action on or think about tomorrow. Don't judge yourself. Just don't judge yourself. Like stop it. <laughs> stop being self-critical. Stop being self-doubting. Like just try to understand why, Amazing. what you're okay. feeling, why you're feeling it. And look Good. for the information. Um, where can people connect with you? Uh, website, social, where do you want to send people? Yeah. Learn more? Um, so my company and my website is the Rethink Group. And it's the rethinkgroup.net. I am moderately active on Twitter. I used to be more active. I've gotten so busy that not so much. It's um, a good problem to have, though. Yeah, yeah, no one needs more. <laughs> the other day I tweeted, like, if I'm tweeting, I'm not doing something I should be doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm Denise, my middle initial K, Shul, S-H-U-L-L. I'm the same thing on Instagram, and I do have a company Instagram and a company LinkedIn, and I think a company Twitter that my brilliant 20-year-old former intern, but now director of something or another, um, runs. <laughs> um, yeah. That's perfect. Okay. And I asked this question, I asked this question, um, and I'll put all this, all the links in the show notes as well. And I asked this question of everyone. Um, so you obviously you've had an incredible career, uh, at this point in your career and also just based on your, on your life experience, what does success mean to you? Real success means more people understand this message. Like that's real success. You know, I've managed some monetary success through building a consulting firm that's got five people or six people working for it. And that's nice and getting to live my dream and living in a ski town. But real success, like I'm now working on a second book. And actually the, the reason, the, the reason, and I'll start to cry. Um, it's like, I literally don't want people to suffer so much. Mm -hmm. by having the wrong view of their emotions and the wrong view of their negative emotions. So the more people that I can help alleviate their suffering and then what I think is become more of who they want to be, that's actually success. Mm -hmm.